Thank you so much for joining. My name is uh, Said Nazokat. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Data Leads. And uh, today's session is about why collaboration is important in fact-checking, essentially fact-checking medical misinformation. Before I start, let me uh, share my screen with you and other folks will join in between. Yeah, just give me a minute and we are all set for the session. Okay, so the session is about why is collaboration important and how we can build collaboration to fact check, in particular, medical misinformation. And I'm, I'm sure in the last three, four days uh, at the Global Summit, at the Global Fact 7, there have been a number of sessions about different approaches of collaboration, the tools, the techniques, how to verify the photos, how to verify the video, how to verify the text, and source and other tools and techniques. So I'm not gonna cover those, uh, those subjects in this particular session. We got all one hour, and my job essentially is to share our own experiences and approaches, how we have been working in Asia, essentially with doctors, healthcare professionals, in building a collaboration which can help a larger ecosystem of fact-checking. So as you all know, the medical misinformation is a growing global public health concern. And it was actually much before you can say COVID happened. Of course, uh, the situation after the outbreak has gone really serious and there have been real life consequences, real life harm consequences. We have seen what happened in Iran because of rumors, people start consuming alcohol and people die. And we have seen in other countries as well, the misinformation about the virus, about the outbreak, has made situation worse. But we have to remember one thing, and which is quite critical actually, that the misinformation does not just come from the dark corners of internet. It is not as if something is emerging from nowhere. No, that is not the situation. Our understanding of, and going through the last couple of years of, you can say, uh, research, training, and also learning particularly about the misinformation about medicine is that, that there are very clear patterns and there are players involved, state and non-state for that matter, who are responsible for the situation which we are facing today in terms of medical misinformation. So when you look at it, why is there so much of misinformation about health? You can actually see and you can actually understand it in terms of identifying the different reasons or characters involved into this ecosystem. But one of the first actually is essentially the awareness. There's not too much awareness in our societies all around us actually. And most of misinformation we have seen, particularly after COVID, actually confirmed this uh, hypothesis that we really lack awareness about key healthcare uh, subjects. Then the rise of social media, we have been seeing millions and millions of people are coming online for the first time, particularly in the developing part of the world where the internet penetration is still slow. So we are seeing that happening. We are also seeing the shortage of doctors in a number of countries actually also amplifies the problem of misinformation or miscommunication. Then we have seen fake research papers, thousands of papers published across the world, and we have absolutely no idea who is the real author and whether the author who has published this research is really a, uh, a person with authority on this subject or not. I remember just one or two years back, there was a global study done, a global story, a part of investigative journalism report, which essentially established how a lot of med fake medical research papers are published by uh, one person with different names and different identities and all. And these papers are then republished in thousands of universities as a, as a part of uh, academic research. And we have seen all those papers were actually fake. We also seen WhatsApp has played key role and other messaging services in, in, in China for that matter, WeChat has played a critical and a, a, a very dangerous role in terms of amplifying the misinformation. And we have seen in India where I live, we have seen how a WhatsApp forward became a source of mob lynching in one of the states, which resulted into more than 31 deaths. Right? And then we are seeing there's a profit behind why this is happening. There's a propaganda behind it. There's a poor journalism. Journalists are not really trained 
how to even do the gatekeeping properly. And that's why these stories are getting published even in the mainstream television channels and the newspapers almost every day. Then we have seen also the, your colleagues and relatives are also part of this ecosystem because they are the ones who know about your, 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 about your health conditions or maybe they visit you in a hospital and they go out, they put something on a social media, which is absolutely not true, but people believe it because they say, you know, this person is a cousin or a father or a son or a daughter of that person who is in the hospital. So we have to believe him. And then celebrities globally, we have seen, even in Asia, we have seen a big celebrities with the millions of followers. They all the time have been like, unfortunately falling for the fake news. And all this actually creates a big ecosystem. Imagine a one fact checker now checking so many different sources of medical misinformation. It's a huge challenge. And then we have also seen globally that there isn't so much focus on the political fact checking and then financial fact checking and all, but we have not seen the same vigor and focus on medical misinformation or fact checking medical misinformation. And our experience, our research in the last two years kind of like gave us this understanding almost 20%, 20 to 25% of misinformation, at least in India, is related to the medicine, is related to public health. And most of these topics are related to COVID, of course, yes, now because it's there and then there's been millions of videos and photos, we know about it, but vaccination has been a, a, a favorite subject for all those people who want to peddle misinformation. And we have seen cancer for that matter has attracted a lot of misinformation. Millions of videos on different platforms are misleading people about cancer and treatment of the cancer. Diabetes, we don't know the reasons why these particular diseases attract so much misinformation. Medicine in general, there are thousands of videos, social media posts about medicine, which are misleading. Skin diseases, again, we have no idea why this is happening. It requires research. But these are the things we have monitored in the last two years. Food, for that matter, essentially. Anything about nutrition, that if you eat this, it can improve your immunity. If you eat this, you may lose your memory, or if you eat this, it can improve your memory. All kind of content related to food has been one of the worst hit uh, by the misinformation and the fake news. Healthcare costs, like people will go online and say that this hospital charges so much and that hospital charges so much, or this surgery costs so much, go viral quickly because there's a public interest involved, but nobody tries to check whether these Facebook post or Twitter post or a WhatsApp forward, whether that is true or not. And we have seen in the last two years, a number of them are essentially fake, misleading or out of context. And similarly, healthcare advisories as well has been a major source of medical misinformation. Now, but this is, okay, these are the favorite topics for people who peddle misinformation. But then we have also seen some subject in medicine, in health, which doesn't really attract so much misinformation. For example, cardiovascular diseases in general, and it's, and it's again subject to a research and in-depth understanding of the, of the, of the particular uh, disease. Why is it that the cardiovascular disease, like some other diseases as well, does not attract so much fake news, right? It's again a matter of study to understand it further. And most of this misleading content and harmful content is often generated by a single source. And that is critical for our own understanding in, in, in order to fight it well. So it's not like, as I said earlier, it's not like somebody somewhere is spreading the fake news or misinformation. It's a quite organized global phenomena. And there are key characters, state and non-state involved at different levels. And what we have seen in most of medical misinformation, almost 30 to 40% content is generated from the known sources like people who have a history of anti-vaccine uh, conspiracies or people who have dedicated accounts on different social media platforms and they have an interest in one particular subject, like cancer for that matter. But there are doctors who have hundreds and thousands of videos who have been seen by millions of people. And these videos go across the world actually and they go in different languages. But the source of most of this content is a single source. In India, huge you can say um, uh, misinformation about vaccine. And we know just a, a couple of years back, one of the uh, most educated states in India stopped vaccination. Why? Because there was a WhatsApp forward saying that doctors who are coming to vaccinate, uh, vaccinate the kids 
are actually going to be harmful for the kids. And the whole town, whole district stopped vaccination. And this was one of the most educated districts in India. And the same is the global pattern. Like it doesn't really matter whether how much educated you are and whether you fall for a fake news or not. We have seen most of people, and there's a big lobby of people around the world, in France, in Italy, in US, who are anti-vaccine campaigners. But now look at this, look at the situation, how worse it could be for kids. The areas I'm highlighting, if you can see on my screen, the red areas of four states in India, every year, one million kids die before the, their fifth birthday in these areas, in India alone. One million kids die before their fifth birthday in, in the areas which I have highlighted in the red circle, in the red colors. Some of them die because of vaccination essentially, and maybe from other reasons as well, but vaccination is really one of the main reasons young kids die so young. Now imagine the situation globally. How big is this story? How many kids die in Africa for that matter? How many die in Southeast Asia? How many die in Europe? Still, I'm saying, in, and how many die in Southeast Asia? We have seen in Pakistan, for example, the whole vaccination campaign stopped. In, in most of tribal areas in Pakistan, after Bin Laden was killed. Why? Because uh, there were a lot of rumors, there were a lot of uh, conspiracy theories that, that the doctors who are part of vaccination campaign are working for CIA. Because one of the doctors who was arrested by the Pakistan army after the Bin Laden killings was recruited by CIA, which the CIA denied later. But he's still in the prison in Pakistan. But one of the immediate fallout of that actually became that there were a series of rumors in Pakistan that uh, the, the doctors who are coming uh, to do vaccination for kids are part of a secret mission of CIA or some other secret agency, and the vaccination suffered. And then we are having the toll of that. So we are saying, what are the main dangers of medical misinformation? What are the, what are the really risks here? Why are we are spending time on it? Why are we are globally now, the WHO, the UNICEF, the big global organization, why everyone is agreeing that the medical misinformation is actually a really, really serious issue. And we need to spend more resources, more time, and more attention towards fighting it, right? So what are the key, re what are the biggest dangers of this problem, of this phenomena? I think the uncertainty, yes, people then, when you, when you spread this misinformation, people do not know what to do next. Like we have seen with the case of COVID patients, they don't know how to get treatment because there's so much information, plus a lot of misinformation, which confuses people what to believe and what not to believe. And they don't really end up in a good situation. So a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear. People do not come out, they don't eat because of fear that they may get infection. Anxiety for that matter, mental stress. People have committed suicide in Asia, in India, because of this fear that they have been infected with the virus. People have committed suicides because they have been infected with HIV, or they, it was just a fear that they, they have uh, got HIV and they committed suicide without actually uh, going for a test. Racism, we have seen attacks on different communities, on different sects, on different religions, on Chinese restaurants in different parts of the world after COVID. So a lot of diseases are kind of associated with certain people, certain groups of people, certain castes, certain nationalities by our own stereotyping. We have seen people discontinuing medication because of misinformation. A lot of people in India, giving example you again, stopped chemotherapy and went to a cow urine because they were told that cow urine, if you take a black virgin cow urine, it can treat cancer. And they went for that treatment and they discontinued chemotherapy. There have been thousands of such cases in India. And I'm pretty sure in other countries as well of different nature. And then the worst part is that, that it also reduces the impact of any health campaign, any health program or any initiative. And then worse than that is essentially that it leaves the whole population kind of clueless. It leaves their ability to think actually under stress. And the worst part of that situation is that they don't really believe after they go through a lot of misinformation, what really to believe. Because for them, 
everything becomes dangerous, everything becomes harmful. And so that is a dangerous situation. And that, when it, when it goes to a society, it creates panic. It creates extreme level of panic. It creates so much panic that people start even doubting their own neighbors. We have seen after COVID in number of countries, doctors were attacked by uh, local communities because uh, they were thinking or there were, they were, they, they were rumors about it that because doctors work in hospitals, they bring infection back to their neighborhood. And we have seen attacks on doctors because of that. So it's a very dangerous cisful situation. And I'm pretty sure the way it has been dealt so far in the last so many years, it has become worse actually. And the COVID-19 outbreak has just brought this situation to us where we're able to now to grapple with it. And we don't know how, how big it can become in the next couple of years. So the question is when the problem is so big and it has been unattended, it has not been given a proper attention in so many years, even by the different governments, even by the different key global organizations, including WHO, which never thought that this was a big subject to tackle. Only they woke up after COVID-19. So the challenge for the journalists is, how are we going to fight it? For fact checkers as well, for doctors as well, because they're also victims of the situation now because of this misinformation. So the challenge is, how, we're going, how are we going to fight it? And can we fight it all alone? No, not at all, actually. I don't think the, 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 the problem, the challenge, which has been created by this phenomena is going to be resolved by one or two fact checkers or one or two great organizations. We need strong collaborations across the field, right? Why collaboration again? Because you can't do everything on your own. You're, you're not a superhero, Superman for that matter, that you will come and you will save everyone and you will become a great, uh, the world's best fact checker or the world's mag magician who has a solution for every uh, fake news and misinformation, who can read all the mi misinformation be be before it circulates on different social media platforms? Absolutely not. So that's not really the solution. We need to have a collaboration and we need to identify who are the people we need to collaborate with to fight medical misinformation or for that matter, any other misinformation. There's a global consensus also around the fact that the future of journalism itself is in collaboration. There was a time, and I think still in a lot of newsrooms, they still believe that, that the journalism was a single man show kind of thing. That you become a great uh, reporter or I become a star reporter of a newsroom by doing great stories and you are all alone and then you're dealing with all the big stories all the time. And, so that happened for 200 years in journalism. And then we had the star reporters around the world uh, having this great glory of doing great stories and great journalism. But then again, we have seen the, the nature of journalism and communication has changed, particularly with the, with, the, with the invent of new technologies. The newsrooms, the traditional newsrooms like New York Times, Washington Post, a lot of others around the world have started having technologists in their newsrooms almost 10 years ago. And we are seeing the impact of that phenomena. That now we are seeing much better reporting, much better data-driven evidence-based reporting happening at a much faster rate. Like one of the stories, you can check any story for that matter. So some of the phenomenal stories around the world are happening because the technologists have become the part of storytelling. At ICIJ, which is the International Consortium of Investigative Journalism, they did the world's biggest investigative story as a part of collaboration. The reporters around the world coming together, supported by technologists who took care of the data and the production of it, and they did that great story. So the future is completely in collaboration. So you need to find people who can collaborate with you, or you need to find organizations which can collaborate with you, right? So I think that is really critical here and that we need to really, really appreciate that we can't be like talking to each other, journalists talking to each other at press clubs, at newsrooms and praising each other's work and thinking we are doing something great. Of course, that's important. Our internal communication has its own value, but the critical thing is that we need to start talking to people outside journalism, right? Uh, there, and there have been a number of global examples how organizations have done it so successfully, right? 
There was a, I remember Chuck Levis was a founder of ICIJ, and later a key member of JIJN. He, he brought scientists together with journalists long back, almost 10 years back. Globally, he, he created a project, he built a project which was essentially about bringing scientists together with journalists and covering st uh, situations and stories about, the, about science. At, at the University of, University of Toronto, we have a dedicated program for doctors to become journalists. So jo doctors who have an MBBS or MD degree go to this course, 17 so far, which was the information I had, went through this course at the University of Toronto, which is designed by a journalist, now an educator and academic, and they're training them how to write well, how to be a storyteller. And some of them have done now award-winning stories they're by training medical doctors, right? So let's have a question here. How many of you consider yourself to be effective collaborators, team players, right? I think almost everyone in our own judgment think we are good team players. Oh, I support people all the time. And I, I help people all the time. I'm a great team player. I sacrifice my own things sometimes, but I keep people happy all around me, right? I think everyone in our own judgment reflection, believe that we are the great team leaders, we are the great collaborators. But is that really true? Now, if I put the question around, how many of you have worked with someone who was not an effective collaborator, who was not an effective team member? I think almost every one of you would say, oh, I have faced so many people who just don't collaborate, who just don't work as a team player. But in our own reflection, we think we have always been a great team player but we have never met people who are great team players, or we have not met people often who are great team players. So I think there's a, there's a good understanding there how to reflect upon your own approaches to collaboration. I will come to that why and why that is important. What you need to be to, to be a good collaborator, it's not easy. It's not easy to work with others. Everybody is happy on his own. Like I can go solo all the time and love to do everything on my own. But when you do collaboration, you are actually saying I'm willing to take a back seat a little bit and allow other people to be part of the game. So I will come back to that actually, what are the key things we need to build this collaboration for fact checking, for medical fact checking essentially. So let me tell you the short story, which is our story. And that may be kind of uh, give you some insight uh, how it could be done in other areas as well. How fact checking could be done in collaboration with lawyers, with scientists, with engineers, with, with so many other people around the world. So what we did, it was, it was uh, I remember 2015, and we invited some 20 doctors and 20 journalists in a remote part of India. And we told them that let's have a get together. We called it data bootcamp. We had no idea what really kind of we want to, like we, we, we had a basic idea. There was some design of it, what really we were we looking for out of this meeting, but then we kept it kind of open. There were a lot of interaction and it was a two different communities coming together for the first time, almost in India. There was never this experiment, uh, experiment done before that you're having doctors and journalists together in a one room. So it was nine in the morning, the room was half full, the doctors were all already in the room waiting for the boot camp to start. Journalists were still coming one by one. Right, so that's also the learning for us how different communities work uh, and then time commitments and respect for the time. And maybe the different time zones we work, journalists usually finish late in the night. And that one boot camp, that boot camp in that remote part of India gave us some incredible insight because I was personally not expecting that the doctors will come for the boot camp because they, they don't have time for, for sting for a whole day, right? But that moment, that day, gave us an incredible insight that, that sometimes you presume a lot of things without experimenting them. Like you presume people will not come forward, they will not collaborate, they don't have time, they have a lot of egos, there are a lot of stereotypes about each other. Maybe it works on a both sides. So what we did essentially was that, at the end of that day, we took, you can say, a couple of notes. And one of the key notes was that we are going to repeat this exercise in different parts of India. And then we ended up actually doing these boot camps all across Asia in 11 countries. 
in the last four or five years. And we have trained more than 3,000 doctors, specialists in oncologists, public health experts, virologists, in different uh, academics at different universities. And this has become a really a strong network of, uh, you can say, uh, support for us in terms of doing our own reporting, journalism, fact-checking. Then last year, after so many years of working with these people in different countries, in Malaysia, in, in, in India, in Sri Lanka, in Bhutan, in Thailand, in Hong Kong, in Maldives, in different parts of Asia, we went year after year and we continued these boot, boot camps. Then we reached last year and then we thought like, let's put this effort, to, let's consolidate this effort. Otherwise, this is a loose network, thousands of people with us. They're all great doctors, great people, great individuals. They're all well-wishers. But let's consolidate this and give it some shape. So this is still a learning. This is a process of still a learning. And we, what we did was that we set up an open call registration. We said, any, any doctor in Asia who wants to become a part of fact-checking medical misinformation initiative, which is a pan-Asia, and all they have to do is essentially spend some hours with us in every month and help us fact check medical misinformation. To our surprise, I think within a month or so, more than 100 doctors across Asia applied to become the fact checkers. It was a voluntary work, no payments. And I will come back to that, why people work sometime, even in, for different projects without financial liabilities. So, 100 out of 100, we selected 10, then 15, and then hope, I think right now we have some around some 20 folks with us from all across Asia who are essentially uh, specialists in different branches of medicine. And then we did two things for them quickly last year again. We invited some of them to Bangalore where we had our first uh, summit on which, which was called misinformation in medicine. And then we did another project uh, another forum, in fact, in Singapore, in collaboration with Google, and we invited other fact checkers who are part of our fact checking and other doctors, more than 140, into that summit again. And after that summit, we again picked a couple of more people from that group. And then uh, you can see the picture of that summit here, actually. And then what we did with that, actually, was that we told them, okay, let's do a simple thing. Let's create a messaging group, a closed door messaging group between our editorial team and with these doctors were based in different countries with different time zones. And we told them very clearly what really we want from them. One was, can you devote two hours for us every month? And can you help us with your expertise because they were from different branches of medicine. Can you help us with say for if there's any video about cancer. So we told our oncologists, can you help at least with some basic understanding why this is happening in us? And then we also encourage them to write more regularly. And most of them actually are now kind of columnists and they're kind of writing. Some are still in the process of writing. Some are still like a uh, little bit, uh, you can say, uh, lagging behind. Some are doing exceptionally well. This is, all, this is all like a learning for us as well and, and a process where we are really exploring how best we can do this network and how we can build and expand and all. So, but essentially in the last, I think in the last, eight, nine months, we have done more than 100 stories. And when the COVID uh, outbreak started in Wuhan, the health analytics team was the first team actually, almost from Asia, which started covering China. Why? Because one of our fact checkers was Chinese journalist, one of our team members. And she was well aware with the Mandarin language. And one of the first stories we did on COVID actually was in fact, in the first week of Jan I think first week or mid of January. And then the second was the, from the Feb, First, we started covering China extensively. I think three cover stories in, 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 in less than two months on China and misinformation around it, including a major story on how misinformation is spreading on WeChat. All that was possible because we had one member with us and who, who was from China, including two, three other people and experts who were based in Hong Kong. And you can check all those stories on a, on a website called firstcheck.in, which was recently launched and all the stories are there. So most of our fact checkers, again, when you look at them and the background, it includes our editorial team and includes people from different fields of medicine and public health, virologists, oncologists, psychiatrists, endocrinologists for that matter, data researchers, public health specialists, and medical officers from 
uh, from Malaysia and Sri Lanka. An interesting thing was the member we have from Malaysia is already running his own fact-checking organization in Malaysia, and they have a huge network there. And similarly, one of our fact checkers from India is a medical doctor in Kerala, and she already was doing shows and doing fact checking on her own as a medical doctor. So imagine how much strength these people have. It's just a matter of how journalists involve them into different uh, initiatives. And you can see these, uh, these are all the people who are right, uh, currently part of this story, part of our fact checking initiative. They're based in different nation countries, almost every country in Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, yes, and uh, I think almost uh, and Hong Kong as well. So when we come to collaboration again, uh, that you know the collaboration also helped us to think and look at things differently, maybe beyond what we were doing, maybe beyond also in terms of uh, designing other areas and other verticals for fact-checking or for journalism. And one of the things we did, which was quite recent, um, which was uh, a project which is called Fact and Fed, which is supported by Google, which is essentially how, what people search online and what does that tell us as a first indicator, what kind of information they're looking at and what kind of information is not available there because that's why these people are going online. So if you ask me personally, I, I think, what we learned in the last couple of years of our experience with the doctors, that somehow helped us to shape this project as well. So your collaboration is not limited to one project, one initiative. It can go from one layer to another layer. And under fact and fact, what we are doing essentially, so we have a task force, again, a group of some of the outstanding public health experts and doctors and health editors, some of the finest in India, because this project is based uh, in India, and they helped us to identify key areas where we should search what's happening on internet, what kind of questions people are asking. You know, why internet is also interesting space because it provides you kind of ambiguity, or kind of a, a kind of a curtain, or kind of a shield that you don't feel ashamed of or afraid of asking anything. You feel like, well, this is online. I can ask all sort of questions. And when you go physically to a doctor or to anyone for a consultation, you kind of hesitate to ask uh, about particular things or particular subject. Maybe you feel like, oh, this is very personal, or this is like stupid question and all. But internet, you can ask all sort of questions. And in the last, I think, three, four months, what we have been seeing, like you can see the questions here. These are some of the questions people have asked about COVID. Like, you know, you, you can get sense of things by just looking at these questions. Why are people looking at this particular question? And you also know the locations, for, for example, what kind of, um, uh, like, no, no, you, you, you can think of some understanding of a person who's looking for this particular information. Like say, for example, if somebody's, uh, question eight, for example, if somebody is looking for an answer after reaching Delhi, which is India's national capital via train, can a person enter directly to his home? This is a genuine valid question. Someone who's, come, who, who's trying to go back to home to India or Delhi for, for that matter, he is asking on internet. He's just putting question on internet. Can I go home without maybe going to quarantine or whatever? Or maybe someone is asking, can a COVID-19 separate through a daily newspaper? And as you know, a lot of newspaper circulation around the world went down because people stopped buying newspapers because of fear that it carries COVID-19 virus. So in fact, people were actually writing these questions on internet. And we have been able to map these questions to a Google alert system and a Google question hub. And then we were able to um, almost more than 5,000 questions, I think so far, we have gone through in the last couple of months, covering those, uh, covering those 14 diseases actually. But these questions give you the first indication. If you ask me, what is the future of fact checking? The future of fact checking is trying to understand the making assessment of areas which can become harmful so that you can scale, you can scale your efforts, monitoring efforts to stop anything which could harm people at a larger level. So the, these kind of questions give you the first indication what could become viral, what could become harmful, right? Like was COVID-19 virus created in a lab? 
So that somebody has asked it on the internet as a public space. Somebody has written this question because he wants to know answer because he has heard a lot of rumors that Bill Gates or for that matter, other people have built this virus in a lab. Now he's asking a very honest question on the internet. And we were monitoring these all questions through a process, a team of like, um, a team of, um, you can say our data journalists and editors, then going through these questions, just to understand what kind of questions people ask on internet. And then I, I have a kind of a, like a, like I designed a little bit kind of a, for a brainstorming session, you can do it in your own newsrooms and in your own organizations. How can you think and design a, a platform for fact checking? What are the key components of fact checking? How can you do successful uh, fact checking in terms of, of course, on health, but maybe in other areas as well? So I think there are four key components of any collaborative effort, any collaborative initiative. And that essentially involves risks. The risks include losing some of the decision power you have. Because if you are alone, single organization, you can take all the decision for your organization. But when you collaborate with two, three, four, five organizations or people, then you give some decision making power to them as well. So they have equal or some portion of decision making, you can say power as well. So you're losing that, you're taking that risk by collaborating with others and you're telling them, okay, you're a part of decision making. Now I will not take all the decisions on my own. Responsibilities, you have to critically think what kind of responsibilities you will give to the partners, collaborators, at what level? You don't need to give them all, right? Even if you work with doctors for that matter, you don't need to tell them, oh no, you take care of everything and we will just sit back and just interview you guys. No, no, that will not work. You have to be on the driver's seat, but you have to design a mechanism for collaboration, which works for better journalism and better storytelling and better fact checking. Resources that you have to be willing to share. Share tools, share techniques, share resources, share research, share facilities and technology. Because we have often seen, sometimes we want to keep something like a kind of, a, we don't want to share it. Because then the, our competition may take advantage of that. But I think that in collaboration, you really have to trust your partners and then share all whatever strategies and approaches you want to implement for the fact checking. And the final thing I think, which is essentially, I think critical, is rewards. Like if your work is making an impact, it is being seen as an important work, then your partners, your collaborators should share that accomplishment, should share that success. You should give credit to them for being part of this network, for being part of this collaboration. And you should be very honest with them saying whatever role they have played at different level, but you should really be honest with them by acknowledging their different, uh, uh, you can say contribution to this project. And there's also, I'm almost coming to end, I will leave like a, uh, maybe a 10, 15, 20 minutes for questions. You can, uh, you can start actually asking uh, questions. We still have almost 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, if, you, if you start uh, uh, writing your questions, I will ask my colleague uh, Shivali to open the, uh, the, uh, the, the session for the questions as well. If you have questions, please keep, uh, start writing and I will take one by one after I finish in the next four or five minutes. So we have also a very critical, uh, we need to build a critical understanding of, uh, of a larger ecosystem. And what is a larger ecosystem? L larger ecosystem is that, that the journalists are not essentially and wholly responsible for misinformation. A lot of people blame, blame journalists all the time. Hey, because of poor journalism, things are going wrong. No, it's absolutely not. There are different players involved, state and non-state players involved. There are di at different levels and all work in at different equations and they create a big global challenge. So journalism, poor journalism, of course, is responsible to some extent, but not really like for everything. Like that's really, I, I never, I, I don't really think that is a right approach to like blame everything on journalists. Another question is, which often we have a self-doubt as, as a journalist, as a storyteller, as a fact checker, why should people collaborate with us? Why should they come forward, do it for us, do it for journalism, do it for storytelling, do it for fact checking? So we need to also realize and understand what are the motivation, different levels of motivation for different people to be part of something. And you will be surprised, the motivations can be absolutely different for different people. Maybe for some people, it may be money. Some people, it may be fame. 
Some people, it may be that they're becoming part of a larger community by becoming part of it. Some people, it may be passion. They just want to fight it because they want to fight it. That's it. And some people essentially want to know what is this fact checking? What is this me medical misinformation? They want to be part of it to learn more about it. And so you have to really work hard to figure out what is the motivation of the group which you are targeting. Do they want money so that they can write for you and do fact check stories? So then you can hire them as a best data journalist, as a best public health editor or whatever, you can hire them. But maybe some are just there, they want to be like a part of this bigger community. They want to be part of a bigger cause. Like you must have seen a lot of people particularly after retirement. They have oceans of experience. They have worked for 30, 40 years. They have written papers. They have done procedures. They have been part of decision-making bodies in healthcare, I'm particularly mentioning here. They have a lot of experience. But after retirement, they don't really feel fitting anywhere. So your, your effort can be something which can attract them to be part of this moment, right? And some people want to write. They have opinion on, on strongly about something. Like I've seen in India, we have, a, we have a couple of doctors who are very vocal about a lot of public health issues. They have written books, some of the, uh, I think, wonderful books. I think one of the best books on, med on public health in India is written by a former health secretary of India, a uh, title like, uh, Who Cares About Healthcare? And I, I, don't, I, I don't remember the title. It's like, yeah, it's essentially on healthcare issues in India and mentioning about the deep loopholes in the policy making. Like we have seen a farmer executive, a senior executive in a pharma, pharmaceutical company becoming a biggest whistleblower against the biggest pharma company in India. And that book became like one of the world's best investigative journalism, or you can call it fact-checking book on generic medicines. Right, a lot of examples of these people who are really driven by cause. So they can join you and our membership puzzle project has done a great uh, kind of analysis of these different motivations. And I think we need to identify these uh, motivations. And you can, I, I'm talking particularly about doctors because uh, essentially about the medical misinformation, but then you can, you can amplify it and adopt this and replicate this model into so many different areas of fact checking. Like you can do something with AI and have a team of, best technologists in the world part of your fact checking and design something which can predict or which can monitor uh, things at scale. You can have postman part of your fact checking. You can have a, a network of 10,000 postmen across the world who can be part of your fact checking. They can help you with the pin codes, addresses and everything because postman is the one person who knows the community like, like, like anything because he's visiting them almost on, on a daily basis. Religious leaders can be part of fact checking. Elected officials can be part of it. Business people can be part. Like chartered accountants can be great fact checkers for financial stories. So you can build a global team of fact checkers with financial accounts expertise. Lawyers for that matter. Scientists, educators, military veterans for that matter. Because there are a lot of misinformation in different areas. And the way I see it in the next 10 years is that the challenge is going to be bigger and bigger and bigger. And there will be a space for niche fact checking. Like you will fact check only this, you will fact check only this, and you will build verticals along those fact checking initiatives. It's not like you will have a, like a BBC World Service covering everything inside out. No, absolutely not. The future of journalism is also going local, doing local stories and local fact checking in the local languages with this particular expertise. So there's a lot of, I see a lot of a lot of opportunities there for, for, for fact checking. But there's also some pitfalls. And I think we have just last 10 minutes, I'll quickly go through it. There are also some areas where you really need to pay attention. What are the areas where I need to prepare myself well and my team well? I will suggest five things. First, you should have a clear idea. Why are you collaborating? Because a lot of people just want to join something and they don't know what they're joining. So you need to be absolutely clear. What is your mission statement? Who you are? What do you want? What area you want to fact check? Whatever. And do you have a, a vision in mind how you want to build it in the next five, 10 years? 
Collaboration also means you will get a lot of emails, a lot of SMSs, a lot of WhatsApp messages, a lot of phone calls. Are you ready for that information? Are you ready to consume all this? Because it needs a lot of logistics, emails, inflow, outflow. Are you ready to deal with all that information out there? You have to build a team which is better uh, in terms of going through things quite, quite quickly and implementing them quite quickly. You have to be sure that you're meeting the right people at the right time. Right? Like in, in the middle of COVID, you can't think of doing fact checking, for example, in health of tuberculosis. No, you have to focus on COVID. This is new. This is happening right now. So you need to find right people and right time for fact checking. And you have to be ready for the more work because collaboration eventually means more work. Everyone in the team has to be willing to spend more time if you want to collaborate with other people. And you have to also remember that working together is not a magic bullet that a one model can, you can copy one model, okay, and say like Health Analytics Asia has built an organization called First Check, which is a collaboration between doctors and journalists. Let me do something with engineers called something else and it will be a collaboration with journalists and engineers. No, it will not work that way. You have to really build a model and sustainable model. How will it sustain on its own? There's a great learning and I think we are also learning in this process. What is the best approaches of building collaborations? And I think also you need to imagine, you need to dream big actually, even in the fact checking, how are you building future fact checking organizations? Like for us, if you ask me from our experience, it's really building a global movement on fact checking. It's not a regional issues, these are global issues. And we are facing almost similar threats in Africa, in Johannesburg, in Italy, in London, in Australia, in US, in India. The, the patterns of misinformation are almost identical. And I, 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 we don't have much research available, but I think in the next couple of years, it will be also one area where people will do a lot of in-depth research. And that will also help us to identify the future of fact-checking in these particular areas. But I personally see an endless possibility of collaborating with people who are not journalists. So don't spend too much time uh, in your own newsroom, in press clubs, in different organizations of journalism and all. Try to explore the world beyond these traditional sources and think of building something big. And I will also say, this is my pitch for you guys. If you want to be part of Health Analytics Asia's fact-checking initiative, which is with doctors, you can join on this link. But this is only open for, if you are a doctor, public health specialist, data researcher or technologists. Unfortunately, this is not open for journalists because journal essentially is a collaboration with our newsroom with these fact checkers. Because I'm aware a lot of people on this Skype, on this webinar are from the medicine background or technology background or data background or a video, uh, you know, like you can say, like people with, with deep video skills and all. It's all open for them. They can join. And we are very happy to work with journalists also at a different collab collaboration level, but they can, we can share our content free of cost with them and they can publish, use it, whatever. It's absolutely free of cost. So that was it. You can take a picture of this. If you want to see the link, I can hold for a one sec and then we can move to question answers. And if and Shivali can help me, I was not able to see uh, the questions. And I, uh, thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful session. Um, You've spoken a lot about the misinformation in the health sector, and we have questions regarding that. So yeah. we have a question from Valencia Viji. She's saying that um, you mentioned fake research papers as one of health misinformation reasons. In the right. time uh, prior to COVID-19 pandemic, one of the disinformation source is tobacco industry. What right. is your suggestion for this situation? And uh, also a similar question coming in from Urvashi and uh, Archana on mental health, misinformation related to mental health and misinformation right. related to uh, weight loss and so on and so forth. Your suggestion? Let me come to research papers. You know, it's really a serious matter and I will suggest uh, you Google it and you'll find a lot of in-depth investigative stories about uh, medical research. And uh, the, the thing is actually there that, you know, you have to really identify which organizations in your country have been identified selling, producing, publishing misinformation. You have to mark them 
like you have to blacklist them so that you don't fall for any 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 misinformation from these organs like in india we have dozens of organizations which have been identified by journalists first and then by the government and there are court cases against these organizations which have been producing fake paper so i think the first thing is identify them well and identify the different lobbies because if you're a journalist and you want to build your career covering particular subjects then you need to really pay attention to the to different uh, actors who are involved in that factor in in that field for that matter like if you look at also tobacco there's a huge global it's it's a billion dollar business and there are huge companies and huge interest involved and they keep doing advertisements though uh, any advertisement about tobacco is actually banned in a lot of countries but still they find ways and means to promote these products to different means and 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 they also raise questions through these advertisements that no tobacco is not responsible for oral cancer for that matter and they will very subtly do these advertisements or so hoardings and say no like you you are killing tobacco farmers by not uh, by banning tobacco and all that stuff so my suggestion is identify these key players in your country in your region identify their webs they have a dedicated social media uh, pages identify those pages they have a channels video channels dedicated video channels identify them like in india we have identified hundreds of these channels actually over the years you identify them and then mark them so whenever you so as a part of a fact checking so one of the first first fact check you could do is what is the source of this is it from this particular website the moment you see that particular website you will say okay uh, this is not a trustworthy source and you can do your story you can inform people oh, you have to be careful about this particular person like in india we have a like almost like couple of hundred doctors who run dedicated channels and they all the time come up with a lot of conspiracy theories about almost everything like uh, the lemon can cure covid-19 a uh, cow urine from a black virgin cow can cure breast cancer for that matter like all they can go to all suspects and all whatever but we have to be very careful in identifying these people first and then it's easier for you to fact check so i forgot the second second question shivani okay yeah right so so you've mentioned the uh, source um, uh, is something that a person needs to check could you mention a few sources which people should refer to to verify information regarding the health sector okay. and especially of for covid right now since that's the in thing i think certainly that one of the global i think um, sources of information on any most of the diseases is the who and i think the uh, who has done uh, like huge uh, effort in the last i think one or two years they put everything online they do annual reports the numbers data everything but i also suggest that even if it's from who still try to make sure that there's no flex something a human error kind of situation because at the end of the the people who are filling different excel sheets there so who is certainly the one of the finest sources of data and research available on public health there are big global initiatives in america which like john hopkins for that matter harvard university for that matter or if it is about mental health dart center uh, which is a part of columbia university uh, is a, one of the major sources of uh, information on mental health and in different countries there are different uh, think tanks which are completely dedicated to the uh, public health research like in india for example we have the icmr which is the leading think tank on a public health for that matter and in 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 australia we have the george institute of global health which does lot of research about nutrition and they have a app also on nutrition about salt intake and all so there are a lot of global lancet is a major source of very well established source of uh, medical mis, uh, information so these are all great sources and different countries have established organizations which do peer review and scientific research and evidence based i you know surveys and all so i will suggest in every region there are these organizations you 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 try to identify them and identify the people who are responsible for uh disseminating the information so that you are in, in touch with the right people and on covid essentially uh, who has set up a chat box for covid uh, inform related information which is great source of information and the ifcn has set up a great source of database a data repository about all the fact check stories in the world there at one source which i i have seen has done so beautifully for the benefit of all the, i think for the larger public you, you can also check whenever you find something you can quickly check whether this is uploaded on i have seen website or not right so thank you so much uh, we have another question this is this comes from ashraf he's saying um 
so how to deal with people who are not that literate and who just receive a message and get agitated how do you think we should build awareness so that there is not much of misinformation or fake news any suggestions no i think uh, yeah we need to talk more about uh, to be honest about um, approaches at the ground level that's why i mentioned about how important the collaboration is actually so whatever you do it, it just should not be like online and video and then webinar classes it it has to go to the grassroots level that i i personally believe that in future the fact checking will be a kind of a curriculum built even for kids so they will be told uh, the ownership of information what is ownership of information what is the visual literacy i think these subjects somehow uh, my kid is in the uh, second and third standard i can already see uh, in some of the subjects even at that basic level are being like he, he they have a courses on data even at the second and third grade so i think in the future uh, the education the nature of education will change and people will be informed about uh, the changing landscape of information as well right so thank you um, um so so you mentioned about uh, a very unique initiative called first check which is a unique collaboration of doctors and data researchers uh how do you uh, plan to scale this up this entire project of this it's, it's a unique collaboration you've done it across asia uh what is your way forward with respect to first check this is a good question no it's already big actually so we are already like across asia so we are trying to learn how to manage it well and how to kind of consolidate it you know uh, we, and to be very honest with you we don't think we have um, we, we we have explore the full potential of this collaboration because the doctors who are part of this collaboration are really some of the outstanding people in healthcare in their own field and they have great things to contribute great things to share so we, i think in the next if you ask me next one or two years our effort will be to consolidate and to improve uh, this particular collaboration in this particular field of course we may do something else in different fields as well but uh, at the moment the first check remains essentially a, a collaboration between journalists doctors in asia we may have doctors from abroad from other countries and other continents as well but the focus will remain on asia right so um you also mentioned another project of yours which is uh, fact and fit so so dipta sen gupta has a question as to how did you find out the questions asked on the internet is there a specific tool to which you need to type in your question or how does it work So the, okay, that's a, that's a good one. So Shivali, we have we can take two more questions. I will answer this. After this, we can take two more questions. Uh, so the fact and fit is essentially a collaborative project again, in which a couple of organizations came together, supported by the uh, Google News Initiative. So Google has a tool called Question Hub. Actually, that Question Hub captures all the questions which people post on internet, and they are consolidated on Question Hub. It's still in a prototype stage. and once these questions they go into a you can say a, a through a kind kind of filter they reach to a, a you can say a spreadsheet on question hub from there we have access internal access to see all those questions and we uh, classify them under these 14 diseases and then we see what people are asking under different diseases so that is the one part of it which is essentially access we have we, we are, which we have got as a part of our collaboration with the google news initiative to understand Uh, what kind of questions are asked on internet second we have also set up our own link on health analytics uh, uh, website called you ask we answer in which people can directly ask us questions as well and then we answer them and most of these questions actually we have put in a public particularly related to covid because of the concern of large of public health we have put all these questions uh, on our website and we have also answered these questions so that's like If if you go to the website and you go to the you, you ask we answer, you can see hundreds of questions which we have answered in the last four five months. Again, with the help of again these questions were ans answered with the help of our team of doctors. So you can see how collaboration works actually at a different level. Yes, yeah, sure. Right. Okay, so there is one question from uh, Miko Angela. Um, yeah. want to know uh, one challenge we have faced in collaborating with doctors is that they usually they are usually hesitant when it comes to mis or disinformation that are political in nature for example debunking a health related claim made or spread by the president do you have any suggestions on how we can deal with this situation yeah i think yeah, yeah that's a very good question excellent question actually of course these 
these uh, doctors may be working for say for example for government hospitals or medical colleges so they will have their own concerns and in our case for example we have two doctors in our team from two different countries who are actually health officers with the ministry of health so you can understand uh, that there is some you know like a concern for for their careers and other stuff so i think one of the best ways is that always try to protect uh, even your your doctors and sources in that case and don't quote them for a particular story if that is going to harm them but i'm pretty sure if it is about a disease say it's about virology maybe you can take a quote from a one doctor who is based in one state and maybe in another or maybe based in another country and ask him to for his expert opinion on that particular coming uh, uh, instead of asking a doctor who is based in that particular state and is working in that particular ministry so that's one of the easiest ways you can do it and uh, so that is one and second thing is that's often you don't need to actually quotes from these people they may help you with the background information and background context which is more important in scientific reporting in healthcare reporting and you need to understand the context the background the evidence and they may they may refer you to a research journal or a paper like i can give you example like we were looking at uh, just recently we were looking at the data about the deaths of doctors in india because of covid and there was no database as such there's no data maintained by a profession wise like lawyers engineers or doctors there's no such data at the central level but somehow uh, through a lot of crowd source mechanism there is different sources and there was one source which mentions there are some 37 doctors in india who have died because of covid 19 so when we did that story and we shared that story in our group with the team of doctors immediately one of our doctors informed us that no your number is not really up, uh, updated more than 45 doctors in india have died and he gave us a list and names of all those doctors because doctors have their own network as well imagine in india alone we have 1.3 million doctors in china we have 3 million doctors a huge community and they are very well connected with each other across the world you know doctors actually collaborate uh, along their streams like there's a global association of oncologists global association of dermatologists so they work very closely because through conferences summits and also the the practice of continuous learning in medicine so the doctors are actually very well network community along their own streams so they can also refer you to other people who are experts on that subject and they will say okay i may not be able to be answer this question but i can refer you to someone else last question sorry yeah. is there anyone okay so we have a question from uh, marinet Uh, she's saying in the current situation doctors are already very busy with their work as frontliners it's actually already very hard to get medical expert sources to help us with stories mainly because most of them are occupied how do you suggest we address this i think it's it's a really a uh, great question and i can really see this as as a one of the challenges for the journalist so that's why i i believe as the journalist you really need to uh spend time and resources to build your contacts well before the story happens so it, it's with any story for that matter you it's very hard to find sources in the middle of story so covid is 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 right now happening in front of us so it's naturally very tough for anyone to find a a great say for example a virologist because they're so busy in the middle of everything they may not have time to answer so that's why it's very important that you know we build our association and spend some time and resources to build our sources well before all like any any eventuality or any any outbreak or any situation for that matter in journalism for different any in different fields as well like uh, you need to spend some time in advance to build your sources and contacts so that you, if you need them in the middle of night or in a very particular tough situation at least they can confirm something quickly on a whatsapp quickly on a email or a messenger they say oh yes this thing is happening in our hospital i can't talk to you right now i'm in the middle of something because he knows you well in advance actually and he can take your call at that time as well so i think journalists really need to spend a lot of time also on building a resource base of experts around their field and i think that will be i think one of the ways for any field for that matter not only about medical misinformation for any field for that matter so particularly with the covid i would suggest uh, still now we are in the middle of this situation and this is a challenge a lot of journalists are facing there are not enough experts in covid so a lot of people are interviewing cardiologists or public uh, administration hospital administration people on covid which is absolutely i don't think that is the right way to go the best experts on, on covid will remain epidemiologists public health specialists virologists or for that matter 
people who have done research uh, about uh, respiratory medicine for that matter, or um, community medicine for that matter. So there are people still available. There are a lot of global experts at WHO, others who are uh, kind of open to answer questions. But yes, I completely agree. This is a quite tough situation for doctors. And then uh, explaining to journalists or explain, uh, re uh, replying to their emails is not really their top priority, right? So I, I will say thank you so much. And I will really, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation with you. I, and I wish you all the best. Stay safe wherever you are. And I look forward in future that we will get a chance to uh, stay in touch. And um, uh, uh, my email is as simple, my name, just site.mazaka.gmail.com, which is simple. You can just email me if there's any other question. And I look forward meeting you in person somewhere soon. And it's quite late already here, 9.30. So I wish you good night if you live in Asia or other. Right, other sir. Groups. Thank you so much. Uh, we've already posted the link for anyone who's interested in becoming a member of First Check. Uh, if any of your friends who is a doctor or a data scientist or researcher would want to be a part of First Check, we posted the link in the chat box. Uh, also, if you have any more questions, you can also write to our editor. Uh, the email ID is editor.hai at gmail.com and, Shiva, and Shiva, also posted if in I, the chat box. If I, yes. if I mention one last thing, I forgot about that. We are also selecting 25 health editors and journalists across India for a fact check training of four days, which will happen in the next month, most probably. If you're interested about uh, joining that uh, training, which is organized by and supported by Google, and we'll be very glad to have a senior editors, health editors and journalists, part of uh, 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 first and uh, uh, this initiative of called Fact and Fed. And if you have, if you want that as well, you can drop an email to us. The editor H A I Gmail is already there. We'd be very glad actually to have some of you. If you are in India, if you are in India, some of you part of that. So with that, I will just say thank you so much. A wonderful meeting you all online, virtually. We're looking forward to meet you somewhere face to face. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs>